Welcome. My name is Xenophon Papadimitris, and I'm a professor of biomedical informatics and data science here at Yale. I will be the primary instructor for this certificate program. You will also learn from some of my colleagues, both from Yale, other universities, and from industry. Our primary goal in creating this program is to provide learners with the foundation that is needed to successfully both work and provide leadership in the broad space of medical software, both in the medtech industry and in related areas. There is, for example, increasing interest in medical software in the pharmaceutical industry. The design, development, testing, and regulation of medical software, especially in this era of the growing use of artificial intelligence techniques, is an increasingly multidisciplinary enterprise. We strongly believe that to be successful in this area, one not only needs to be an expert in their own discipline, but also have the broad background to understand why the other members of their teams or companies do things the way they do. Our goal in creating this program is to educate leaders who can bridge across disciplines and understand more than just their own specialist language. Let us think as to who is involved in this process. There are software engineers, data scientists, regulatory and quality professionals, doctors, marketing professionals, training and support professionals, and many other types of people that are involved in this process. These all come from different educational and professional backgrounds. To create successful products, however, and critically to advance human health, all these must be able to work together towards a common goal. To achieve this, we need a common language and at least some shared knowledge. As appropriate for a university program, we'll focus primarily on the why questions as opposed to the how questions here. To give an example, we will not teach you how to create FDA applications. We'll instead focus on explaining why the regulations are what they are and a little bit of why they, what they should be like and why some of what one is required to do is there. In some sense, this is a liberal arts program in medical software and AI as opposed to a training program that one could and probably should in addition attend that is run by professional industry associations which focus on specific tasks. Let me illustrate the design of this program by using an example that may feel far in the future but may come to pass sooner than we think. Consider the case of the use of ChatGPT in medical products. Assume you're all familiar with the type of, this type of language-based system that can answer questions on all kinds of topics. In universities, this is becoming a serious problem as it can be used to complete many homework assignments. ChatGPT has also been found, in some cases, to provide remarkably accurate diagnosis of medical conditions from descriptions of the symptoms of a patient. Now, let me be clear, this is far from perfect and often produces erroneous answers. So please don't rely on this for diagnosing medical issues for yourself or your families. Let us then ask the question, what would it take for something like ChatGPT to become a useful tool in medicine? Better yet, what do we need to understand to appreciate what this process will require? This will require a mixture of law, engineering, computer and data science, and given our area of application, medical knowledge. The first thing we need to appreciate is that any such tool will be a piece of software that will need to run on some kind of computer. If it will be used to diagnose patients, then this software will be regulated as a medical device. Now, what are the rules and process for creating such software? How are they designed, implemented, and tested? What does the regulatory process involve? When does the regulatory process begin, and when does it end? This topic will be the focus of the first of the four modules of this program, during which we will cover the basics of medical software. Each module will last for four weeks, and this will be the first module. The next and obvious observation is that ChatGPT is based on techniques that come by the collective name of artificial intelligence, or AI for short. Engineers and data scientists tend to prefer the more precise term machine learning to describe this type of technology. There's a long history behind these terms that we'll briefly discuss, but for all intents and purposes, they are now synonymous. But what is machine learning? In the second module of this program, we present a broad overview of machine learning, including some of its history, fundamental issues, and a discussion of cutting-edge techniques such as deep learning methods and what has come to be known as generative AI. Our focus will be on helping students understand what these methods are, what the limitations are, and what the potential problems might be when we bring such methods into clinical use. We now appreciate that our ChatGPT tool will then be a piece of medical software that incorporates a module based on machine learning. What is the impact of the addition of such modules to software tools? Traditional software is explicitly designed by a team of humans. We create the rules and then implement them in code. This makes it easier to test as we have detailed information as to what exactly our tool is supposed to be doing. 
By contrast, machine learning modules involve us teaching a computer to learn the rules from examples, what is termed training data. This changes how we design software and how we ought to regulate it. The focus in some ways moves from the code to the data. In the third module of the program, we'll learn about how the incorporation of machine learning modules changes how software is regulated and developed. We'll also discuss related issues such as data privacy, cybersecurity, and societal concerns such as bias and fairness. We'll also touch on the impact of horizontal regulations such as the EU AI Act on medical software. The final part of the journey will involve us going to the healthcare setting to understand how AI tools are already used to improve patient care and management. If our tool is going to be useful, it needs to work in this environment. We'll first discuss some different applications of AI-enabled software in medicine. We'll first look at tools in medical imaging and radiology, and then we'll see what it takes to create clinical decision support tools. Next, one of my colleagues, Annie Hartley, will take us to Zanzibar in Africa to learn and discuss how such tools are impacting global health in low reserve settings. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about emerging potential applications in genomics, data auditing, and multimodal AI, and think about where the future might take us. Let me give a flavor of some of what we will cover. The picture shows the game Clue, or Cluedo in Europe. As someone who has played this game as a child, the goal of the game is to solve this murder mystery. The answer might be classically, Colonel Mustard in the ballroom with a rope. Let us parse this answer a little bit. It is a compound answer, which is a response to four separate questions. Who did this? Colonel Mustard, the user. What did they do? In Clue, this is implicit. They killed somebody. This is the use. Where did we do it, the location, in the ballroom? What did we do it with, the rope, the tool? These are the fundamental questions at the start of any medical software project. Who is our user? What do they need to do? Where will they be doing it? And on what computing platform will they be doing it on? If we get the answers to these questions wrong, the rest of the project will fail. These answers create the use case or use cases for our tool. These are critical because they will determine what level of regulation our tool will be subjected to. The FDA and similar regulatory agencies around the world base this not on what the software does, but on how it will be used. The fundamental question is really one of risk. What can go wrong here, and what could the impact of this be on the patient or the caregiver? If failure of such a tool can result in the death of a patient, then the regulatory expectations are much higher than if failure is a minor annoyance. This is critical. The lesson, and I'll repeat it again here, is that our focus is not on what the tool does, but on how it will be used. Here's a second picture. This is a game of telephone that many of you may have also played as children. This consists of children in a row, and the first one whispers something into the ear of the child next to them, and the information gets passed on from child to child until the end. Usually what happens is that what the last child understands the message to be is very different from what the original input to the system was. This illustrates the second critical problem, that of information transmission across a multidisciplinary team. The first child represents perhaps the user, whereas the last, the, the person implementing the code. How do we make sure that the code reflects the needs of the user? This explains in part there's a focus on documentation and paperwork in this area. The adage I have heard quoted many times is that if it was not documented, it was not done. Communication is a critical part in this process and we need to both get the information across and be able to understand what is being communicated. This is why this type of broad program, in my mind, is particularly valuable. Let me talk a little bit now about the structure of the program. It will run for 16 weeks. Each Wednesday, the students will get access to a pre-recorded set of videos running about one hour. They will also be asked to complete a short multiple choice quiz to ensure that they understand the material. The quiz will be due each Monday. On Tuesdays, we'll have live Zoom sessions where I, other faculty from Yale, and guests from industry and regulatory agencies will answer questions and discuss the topics further. The program will build on previous work that my colleagues and I have done in this area. I have taught a class called Medical Software Design at Yale since 2017. My notes for the class became the basis for a textbook, Introduction to Medical Software, Foundations for Digital Health, Devices, and Diagnostics, that I co-authored with two colleagues from the School of Management here, Aisha Kuraishi and Gregory Likolai. We then recorded a Coursera Companion online class called Introduction to Medical Software, the first module of this program directly derived from the Coursera class. 
I must acknowledge the obvious here, that it is impossible in a short program to completely cover this large topic. In fact, many of the weeks that we will cover here will be summaries of semester-long courses. Our goal is to give you a sense of what you should know, or to put it more technically, to convert your unknown unknowns, the things that you do not know that you do not know, into known unknowns, things that you are aware that you don't know, and to provide you with the tools for learning more about this. Ultimately, the goal of teaching is not to simply transfer information, but to give students the necessary preparations so they can embark on their own adventures, where they will acquire true knowledge from experience. What we will try to do here is to create for you a map highlighting interesting places to visit and dangerous regions to avoid. We hope that you will join us on this journey. Thank you.